Sharing to live stream. Okay. You want to go ahead and go to the okay. webinar? I just want to make sure I don't get an error. <laughs> yeah. It says it's setting up the webinar. Done. Directing to YouTube. Oh, you can see it. <laughs> okay, it's it's working. So okay. I'm gonna tweet it right now. Perfect. All right. And I think you're gonna have to put closed captions again because every time that you exit, it has to be. All right, I am broadcasting. Ready? Are the captions on? Yes, I think, let me see. Yes. They are. Yep. All right, broadcast. Hey, good morning, everybody. We're going to wait about one or two more minutes just to make sure everybody has the opportunity to join the meeting. And we're going to get we're going to go ahead and get started in just a minute. Okay, it's 8.30 a.m. and we're ready to start in. We are so happy and glad to welcome you to our uh, Region 10 Bilingual ESL Virtual Symposium. We are so excited that you're here today joining us. We have a lot of great learning opportunities for you. And um, we're gonna go over some of the norms for today's Zoom session. You wanna switch to the next slide? So some reminders for Zoom webinar etiquette. If you can please keep your microphones mute, your video off today due to the rain, we might have some um, issues with connectivity. So just to help with um, the internet, just keep your video off. Use the Q&A um, feature to ask any content related questions specific to Emily's keynote session. So if you have a question for Emily, go ahead and add it to the Q&A. It's on the bottom of your screen. Also use the chat to directly message the panelists with any other issues or concerns. So if you have any questions or you're having any trouble connecting or hearing, just send us a message through the chat and we'll respond to you. We're also live streaming via YouTube. So if you look on the top of your screen, you're gonna see a button that is red that says live on YouTube. If for some reason you get disconnected and you cannot get back into the Zoom room, just go ahead and um, click on that um, button right now, copy paste the link so you can join us on YouTube and you don't have any issues with Zoom. So that's another way to make sure that you keep connected. Okay, um, you wanna go to the next one? Okay, just to um, address the certificates for your um, credit hours, there is no signing sheet on Zoom meetings. We will go ahead and run a Zoom report to mark your attendance on the system. We will work quickly, but we have almost 900 participants joining us in our symposium. So it's gonna take us a couple of weeks or days to get your attendance marked. So just give us uh, some time to make sure all of that is processed. You're gonna receive an email with a survey from Region 10 for each of the sessions that you attended. Please fill out the survey. Once the survey is completed, then you'll have access to your certificate. Okay. Um, 
Um, next slide, please. If you have any questions about attendance, please contact Janet Hadcock or Susan Speed. They'll be able to help you with any issues with the system and receiving your certificate. Like I said, just give us a couple of days to make sure it's processed. Okay, and one more. And I wanna be send a big thank you to some people that are working really hard behind the scenes to make sure this symposium happens and everything goes smoothly. A big thank you to Angela Greca. She's our symposium lead. She's been working on stuff to get everything organized and get everything ready for us today. Big thank you to our moderators. They'll be moderating all of our breakout sessions and our presenters. We cannot do this without you. So big thank you to everyone that has been working um, to make this a reality. So I know with no further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and also introduce our keynote speaker. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say thank you also to our sponsors. This couldn't happen without you. As you know, if you're part of the Region 10 Cooperative, you were able to join our symposium for free. So this is, thank you to our symposiums, Randall Brooks Federal Credit Union, to Literacy and BIM. We're very appreciative of, of our partnerships with them. And now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our keynote uh, speaker, Emily Francis. Emily has a great story. I'm not gonna go into great detail to her story because she's gonna share some of that during her presentation, but we're so excited to have her here today so that she can share um, her journey with us. So I'm gonna hand it over to Emily and um, we're very excited to have you here. Go ahead, Emily. All right, thank you so much. I wanna just take a couple of minutes to thank you, um, Region 10 for inviting me and having me over and thank you to all of you who are behind the screen here uh, taking your time to learn and acquire strategies to better serve your ELLs and your emergent bilingual. Um, I am super excited to be here. Um, beautiful day here in North Carolina. I am an ESL teacher, I'm at the high school level, but I've taught at the elementary school level and I am uh, thrilled to be here letting you know a little bit about my story, but also how is it that we can go and shift those statistics that label our ELL students and we can shift that into stories. And how is it that we can turn our students' stories and um, help them be world changers? So I would like to um, engage, since I cannot see you, I would like for us to connect. I am on Twitter, Emily Fran ESL is my handle. I'd love to hear from you if you are tuned in um, during the presentation. I'm one of those who would love to be engaged with the presenter and share with the world what I'm learning. So here it is, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, Facebook. You can find me on any of those social media platforms. I'm also having to uh, create, I created this mentee account. If you will go in here, I would like to know a little bit more about my audience. So if you go to mentee.com, that's M-E-N-T.com, and use this code 921949. And if you have an iPhone, turn on your camera. You can either scan this Q QR code and it'll take you uh, to that website. Let me go ahead and exit out a little bit. And I have a couple of questions to ask you. So I want to get to know my audience. If I tell you tomorrow, you're going to go to your perfect vacation spot. What would that be for you? Would you like to go to the Caribbeans to like sand and sun and just lay in that heat? Or are you the kind that would love to go to the mountains and do some hiking and exploring nature? Or are you the type of person who loves to learn about culture and you would like to go to places where you learn about history and explore those ancient buildings? I don't know. Tell me which one would be your perfect destination? This is just to get a little bit um, of um, you and just to get to to see what is it that you like best. All right, so, so far I had Caribbeans that are winning, beaches, okay. Culture experiences, I have a lot of you who like to do that. I'm leaning more toward cultural experiences myself too. I love going to places. As a matter of fact, I was in Mexico last year exploring all this beautiful um, culture in Mexico. 
So keep sharing with me. I do have another question. So keep Menti open because I will ask you another question um, so you can engage during the presentation. So, all right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. And before I tell you a little more about how to help your students. I want to tell you about my journey and my story. It is an immigrant story I have to tell you because it is what makes me who I am. It is what is the core of what I do, how I do it and why. And let me just tell you, it's only been a few years that I started sharing my story because it, it's painful. You know, some stories, I'm gonna go back here to the captions, make sure we have those. But I found this quote very encouraging when it comes to sharing one's experiences. And it's from Tara Martin. She says, it takes a lot of courage to expose parts of our identity, but it is often the parts of our stories that are the hardest to share that makes us who we are. They are what makes us real. And I embrace this quote because for so many years, I thought that my immigrant stories, that my experiences had, had no worth. It wasn't worth sharing. It wasn't worth telling. I didn't have the courage to share my experiences until I was encouraged to share it. So here it is. It all starts in a tiny little bit of country in Guatemala. I was born there in Guatemala, 1978, and I lived there until 1993. That's 15 years of loving and experiencing my country. I attended school. I played with children. That's where I had my youth. It was a wonderful place to live. It was just enough time for me to embrace who I am and my heritage. My mother, a single mom with five children, was the woman who gave me the strength to fight th through life and give the best that I've got to exist and to live in this life. Um, I am the oldest of five children. So if you look at the picture, you'll see all the little ones there. And if you know about Hispanic culture, you will know that, hey, we're the ones that are having to help with changing diapers, cooking, chasing the kids around and helping out. My mother was a single mom of five. She worked very hard to make sure that we had food, that we had a shelter. We really didn't own anything per se. We lived in different places. And the business that my mother ran was driving to the coast, filling up a truck with oranges or cauliflower or used clothing and bring it to the city. And we will sit down at a market and sell those goods. And that will make us have enough money for us to pay the rent or buy some food. And I remember sitting at a little market with my basket of oranges or cauliflower. And I will support my mother, whether it was at the market selling the goods or I was at home helping with my brothers and sisters. I attended school when my mother was home. I was able to go to school, but um, it wasn't consistent. So there were many years that I had to be retained and repeat. So when I left Guatemala at the age of 15, I had only acquired a sixth grade level education. But let me just tell you, I had had enough knowledge for me to do presentations. I have, I knew how to read, I knew how to write, I knew how to do critical thinking. I loved and embraced learning and being in school. But at the same time, I loved my family and I loved my mother and I needed to help her to, for us to uh, survive in Guatemala. 
But it was 1992 when my mother decided to leave Guatemala, come to the US, a land that promises work and the ability to make money so you can have what we, ha we can have in Guatemala. I was already used to taking care of my brothers and sisters. So we built a little shack in a neighbor's backyard and I became fully guardian of four kids in Guatemala. My youngest brother was three years old and at 13 I was helping feed the kids, I was helping them get dressed, I was getting them to school, I was doing what a mother should be doing and I was helping my mother. We had the essential, we had a shelter over our head, we had food, and we had enough money to buy a new outfit. So if you see this black and yellow outfit, it was a new outfit I was able to afford and buy because my mother was here in the United States working for us to have what we needed to have in Guatemala. Two years was enough to be away from my mother. Was it hard? Yes, it was. And would you say, why? Why would a mother do that? I am a mother myself of two children. And I cannot imagine being far away, two different countries from my children. When I started college, I started learning about what happens in a person's heart and mind whenever there is a family separation. And research shows that it causes in the mind and in the heart the same exact feeling as when you lose someone to death. So what we were experiencing throughout those two years was painful. She was far away, but we knew she was working. We knew she was here in order for us to have what we needed to have in Guatemala. Here's a picture of the apartment where she poured her life working, cleaning, taking care of a person in order for her to acquire some dollars to send me back in Guatemala for me to have enough food until we started writing and calling. Mom, it's enough. You need to come back. You need to come back. We all miss you. We need you to be here with us. We really wanted to be close to mom. But we couldn't just take those two years that we had experienced so much pain and so much loss and just toss it out the window like nothing ever happened. If she were to go back to Guatemala, we would go back to just existing and not really living back to having nothing and experiencing what we had experienced before so someone put a little bug in her ear her name is leslie leslie why don't you bring your kids here to the united states just the thought of bringing five children here to the united states it's something that is beyond our ability to think and plan the doors began to open and my little brother and sister's dad brought them here in a matter of a month or so and they were here with my mother. For my two younger sisters and myself, the journey was different. My mother hired a smuggler, what we call in Espanol, un coyote. You pay them enough money for them to bring you to the United States undocumented, or what was many will say illegal. I remember that November 1993, when that car pulled up my driveway, my little sisters and I with a backpack just filled enough with what we can carry, a couple outfits, pictures, anything that we can hold on to that can help us get to the United States. When that car pulls up, we did not know that person. The only thing we can hold on to was hope. And as an older sister, I had to hold on to courage and hope 
and believe that getting into that vehicle with a total stranger was going to be the opportunity for me to come and see my mother here in the United States. I take my little sister's hand and we get into that vehicle without not knowing what was going to happen. We rode trains and cars and taxis and buses. Here's a picture of me on one of those buses traveling from Guatemala to the US. The journey took two months. Two months of going from rooms to rooms, houses to houses. We witnessed people struggling with the same things we were struggling, separated by family and just holding on to hope that these people were bringing us to a land of hope. I remember vividly that day when my sister took that picture. My mind was already here in the US, a land of hope, a land of opportunities, a land where I can become the teacher I have always aspired to be. I was nine years old or so when I was at the market selling my oranges and I saw this lady walk by well-dressed, walking so nicely with her little students behind her, like those little ducklings. <laughs> and I looked at her and that's where I started thinking about wanting to be just that, that very well-dressed person and that teacher with that line of students who were aspired to be like her. I didn't know what it meant to be a teacher but that's where I wanted to be. The journey took two months and we made it to the United States. But as you know, we had false documentation. So we get detained by immigration from morning to the evening that January 23rd, 1994, there were questions and questions from immigrant immigration agents. What are you doing here? What, what do you want in our country? You need to go back to Guatemala. Where is your mom? You guys need to go back. We cried and begged to please leave us here in the United States. There was nothing and no one to go back to Guatemala. They began taking our fingerprints for deportation. We see that gentleman that brought us here handcuffed and being taken away. And we cried because we knew it was over. But and then my grandmother who lived here in the United States as an American citizen showed up. And she claimed us as her grandchildren. And as an American citizen, she was able to give us our paperwork. And we were able to walk out of that airport with fingerprints of a immigrant to be able to stay here in the United States as a legal alien, they call it. So here is a question I just shared with you an experience that I had that many of our students have had, or maybe their parents. And as a teacher, one of the most important responsibilities we have in schools is to protect and to advocate for our students' individuality and identity, to protect the gift they have. And that's what I embrace as a teacher to advocate for my student, to make sure that their identity is protected. So I ask you, going back to Mentimeter, if you would have a student coming to your classroom who had experienced what I just shared with you, separation from family, being, having been a, a guardian at the age of 13, experienced migration. What assets do you see in that student? What strengths would you see in me if I show up to your classroom? Share at least three things that you can see 
without even crossing word with your student, but you know their experiences. I see courage. I see love, adaptability, perseverance, all of those things, grit, yes, determination. That's what our students bring. I was only 15 years old when I stepped foot here in the United States and all of this was in me. You are sharing it right now. Courage, resilience, perseverance, independence, yes, bravery, hope. Look at all of these words. These are assets, these are strengths that our students bring that our, their families bring, that share with students. Maybe you students were not born in another country, but their parents were. And their parents are carrying with them all of this strength and share along with their students and children. Keep sharing those. I love that. Let me go back to our PowerPoint. And captions. All right. So knowing, knowing that our responsibility is to protect our students. And later we'll go back to the Mentimeters to see that huge cloud you created with those words. So here it is. November, uh, January 1994. That was the very first evening that I spent here in the United States. That evening, we started telling stories to each other. We shared with mom our journeys here to the US. We talked about what had happened in Mexico and throughout Guatemala. We talked about the future, what each of us wanted to be and accomplish here in the United States. Carol Salva talks in her Boosting Achievement book that the key to success is passion, motivation, and perseverance. The key to success. We had that. All of my brothers and sisters, we had passion. We had the motivation. We had the persistence to be in this country and become what we wanted to become, successful, make a difference, change our narratives. We were ready, but and then there are teachers who tell a different story. Let me read to you a real email I received from a teacher addressing about, talking about one of our newcomers. These are the wrong stories being told about those passionate students. And I'm gonna read it with an attitude because I feel like the way he wrote it was written with an attitude. I have a student who knows no English. She will just be sitting in class all year and not be able to do any assignments or work whatsoever. An idea for you will be to consider putting her in Mrs. Blank's class with Mrs. Francis, because I'm the ESL teacher, in her full-time working completely with ELL students. This is the only way she has a chance of learning anything in civics this year. It's a freshman class, but I can't see that being a problem considering the situation. Obviously, she will fail if she has to be left in my class. It will be like me sitting in a class where only Spanish was spoken. I know no Spanish. I will fail miserably too. Wrong stories, wrong vision that is being portrayed by some educators about the ability and the asset that bilinguals bring to this country. Remember, potential, motivation, perseverance, that says so much about our students. I was only 15, I had only completed the sixth grade. 
but I was not ignorant when I was enrolled at this school, Martin Van Buren High School in Queens Village, New York. I saw this building when I got on the bus and all I can see was my dreams before me. A place that was gonna grant me a diploma for me to go to college and become the teacher that I had always aspired to be. I saw this big building, clean windows, waxy floors, and they enrolled me in ninth grade because of my age. But it didn't take me long for those labels to begin to kick in. Low socioeconomic status. I lived in a basement and we had really no, mu not too much. I didn't speak English. The word okay was about all I knew. I was an immigrant, a scythe student, a student with interrupted education, so I had no chance to catch up. And I was an ESL student, a student who needed to learn English as a second language. Each and every one of these titles puts a burden in our students' shoulders. These titles were weighing me down, and I didn't want any of these titles to interrupt my education. I wanted to become a teacher, but with these titles, that wasn't gonna be possible because that's what statistics tell you. Students with low socioeconomic, who don't speak English, who have interrupted education and they're immigrant, they don't speak English, they're not gonna make it. I worked as hard as I could to be able to break the stigma, break the status quo. I learned English as fast as I could. My grandmother enrolled me at a local community college just to take English courses. I attended AM school, PM school, even evening classes. I poured my heart into schooling. It was three in the morning and I had scattered all over my living room dictionaries and thesaurus translating everything to be able to make some sense of what was happening in the classroom and to show that I could do critical thinking, that I can be something, that I can blend in with the rest of them. I put aside my culture because I needed to blend into the Americanized culture in order to make it in the United States. This is the notion that I walked in when I came to the US and it hasn't changed much today. It's about the same. When our students come in our buildings, we quickly have to make sure that our students meet the achievement gap because we tell them that if they get to grade level, they are going to be successful. And if they are successful, they're gonna be happy. And if they are happy, they're gonna feel like they matter. That was the notion that I was engraved in my heart. There's nothing wrong with encouraging our students to meet grade level. But when the focus is only in academic, because you would think that that is gonna lead to happiness and making sure that you matter, it leads to nothing. It didn't for me. This picture with cap and gown was the last time I took a picture with a cap and gown because I could not graduate high school. Even though I was able to accumulate 42 credits for graduation, the regents exam put a stop on my graduation. In the same building that saw me walk in, aspiring to be something, was the same building that waved goodbye that 1997 when I walked out of that building. I walked to the bus stop with a sense of failure. I knew I had tried, I knew I had given it all, but somehow it wasn't worth what I have given. I failed the system or the system failed me. One of the two but I became part of the Latino high school dropout in 1997. I had no choice but go into a local supermarket and ask for a full-time job as a cashier because I wasn't gonna go back to school. No teacher called me back. 
I didn't get a call from a principal. I didn't get a call from a guidance counselor. I didn't get a call from a social worker. No one cared what had happened to me. My family was very engaged into making sure that we were surviving here with the means that we had in the US. That now me bringing money as a full-time cashier was helping. For so many years, I worked as a cashier and scanning groceries and beeping every grocery was a reminder of my failure. A reminder of I couldn't make it, that I wasn't good enough, that I didn't speak English full enough, that I was an immigrant and that was all I could accomplish. The hard work that my mother had done here in the United States felt like in vain. In 2000, I moved here to the Carolinas. I got pregnant and I knew I needed a new place to start over. So in 2000, I'll go over to a community college and I got my GED just because everywhere that I was looking for a job was asking for a high school diploma, whether it was a bank or a secretary or anything else that I was applying for, they asked for a high school diploma. I wish a teacher or a social worker back in 1997 would have called me back and told me about this diploma, an opportunity for me to continue my journey as in education. In 2004, I started gaining the courage to work in a school system because I still had the desire to work around children. I knew in the bottom of my heart that I could be a really good teacher. I knew that I could make a difference. In the bottom of my heart, I had the motivation to be a life changer. So I applied at a local county and I wanted to be a custodian because I figure I can clean they'll hire me. I didn't want to be a cashier anymore. I wanted to get into the school system and see what it felt like to be around kids. And this teacher here, Angie Power, interviewed me. She needed a teacher assistant, a teacher assistant. Something I had no credential for, something I had no experience for, but what I had was my immigrant journey. What I had was my experience in life and my survival. And when I started sharing that with Angie Power and the principal, they were able to see something in me that I haven't even seen myself, potential. A potential to be so much more than just a teacher assistant. So I started going to college and I got my associate's degree. It took me several years if you look at the date because I had to work full time as a teacher assistant and bus driver. Yep, I drove a bus around my county. And then I transferred over to UNC Charlotte where another test blocked me, but that's another story. It was 2012 when I was given my license to be able to teach. And in 2012, June, that summer, I walked into an empty classroom and I was behind the principal when he pointed to the classroom and he says, this is your classroom, Ms. Francis. I asked him to leave me alone for a few minutes in my first classroom. And as I looked around the bare walls, all I can see and all I can envision was me making an impact far more than my ability. 
I promised myself that I wasn't going to let any of my students walk through that door and having to abandon their culture or abandon their language or hide who they are, but use it as an asset. Tell their stories and value their families and who they are. I started working really hard with teachers, with students, with my community, with my county, and I started to get noticed for the work that I was doing. All these platforms began to pop out, opportunities for me to share my immigrant story. Even Ellen DeGeneres, so if you haven't seen it, you're missing out. My work has been published in many different platforms. UNC Charlotte has shared my story as well. I was County Teacher of the Year. And all of these accomplishments are great. I am thankful for these. And I use them to share my story and my students' story. But this right here, this is what I was looking for an opportunity to protect my students' greatest gifts, their individuality and identity. That's my purpose from day one, from that first day that I walked into that classroom and still today and for many years to come. Opportunities like this top left corner where my high school students write their immigrant stories and share those stories with elementary students so they can show courage of what it means to survive throughout any trauma or any experiences coming to the US. Bottom left corner, you see my first graders work published on a book because he did his very best and I shared his work. I have students looking up at me and say, tu hablas espanol? And their faces lit up. A teacher who speaks their language, a teacher who looks like them, someone that they can look up to, to become their very best. Bottom right corner, you have a student winning the first Spanish spelling bee because I started promoting home language and how important it is. I started meeting with families. I struggle a little bit at the high school level, but at the elementary level, I will gather families to let them know how important it is for them to value education and to um, share with their children their own experiences. This is my purpose and it's a burning passion in my heart that I don't want it to go away. Our students have a purpose. Each and every one of our students has a purpose and it is up to you, up to me as educators to get to know each and every one and stretch it not just get to know their stories, not just get to know their ability, not just get to know their dreams, but stretch it, give them opportunities to be their very best to their full potential. So thinking back to the notion that if you walk into a building, the first thing that we do is encouraging um, academic, what if we switch that up a little bit? What if we start with, hey, you matter. Welcome to our class. You belong here. And a student walks in and your classroom doesn't have owls or cute little Pinterest, but it reflects them. It reflects who they are, it reflects their country, it reflects their language, it reflects their work. What if our buildings show our students that they matter, that they belong in our buildings, that, that they are to stay in is their building? Because feeling that they matter in those buildings is going to lead to happiness. They're going to feel happy to be there. They're going to feel motivated. 
And if our students are happy and motivated, that is going to inspire them and it's going to lead to success. That is exactly the notion we should be working toward. Focusing. Yes, don't take me wrong and hear my heart. I'm a teacher and I get paid to educate and to teach the um, standards and to teach the language. I know that. But if we make content our priority, if we close the achievement gap and that's our priority, then they don't feel like they matter. They're going to feel like you're only looking for their education and not really them. Let me tell you about Jose. I tell you this because stories matter. Jose was one of my first, um, I would say, experiments. So back in 2012, when I started as an ESL teacher, Jose shows up at our building. He was coming from Mexico, didn't speak any English. He walks into our building, scared, shaking, not knowing what was gonna happen. I started talking with him in Spanish so he can feel comfortable. He was enrolled in third grade and he hadn't been in school at all. But I talked to the teacher and I showed her, let's make him feel like he matters. Let's make sure that he feels happy in our classroom, in our building. And we started working on that. We let him work in Spanish. He did whole classroom presentations in Spanish. No one understood what he was saying, but he was showing his strength and his ability. In about a year and a half or when he left us over to the middle school, he had already exited ESL. He was no longer labeled as an ESL student. Yes, he acquired the language, but we started with, you matter, Jose. Thank you for being here with us. You belong here. Now at the high school, I have Jorge and Oliver. I have many stories, but back two summers ago, I walked into a classroom full of high school students who had just come from another country. Some of them had just walked three, four days through the desert to get here. And it was their first experience in a school setting. Jorge is looking up at me like deer in headlights not knowing anything or understanding anything. And he won my heart when I noticed that he was my reflection. He was me a few years ago, sitting in a high school classroom with dreams and desires to make it here in the United States. Because of Jorge's reaction when he saw me and he interacted with classmates, I decided to switch over to the high school. This year, he graduated high school. He received his high school diploma and sent me a picture, beaming a huge smile. But we started with, you matter, Jorge. You're gonna make it. You're gonna take these classes. You're gonna make, we're gonna make sure you're gonna make it. And then we have Oliver. Another student who is still in our school has not graduated, but he has been portrayed in our news, in our newspapers and TV, because he's a great soccer player. He's not a 4.0 GPA, but his passion is soccer. And as soon as we noticed that he was passionate about soccer, boom, we enrolled him in a soccer team, and he was one of our best players of Concord High School. So good that he started being portrayed in newspapers and in, and, and in TV, and making him feel like he mattered because of his favorite sport, motivated him and made him happy to start making good grades and get the college, the credits that he needed to graduate. So he's on the right track and he will be getting his high school diploma and graduate soon. 
I tell you these stories because this no motion works. When students feel like they matter, they're gonna feel happy and that inspires them to be successful. Oliver will send me a message and he'll say, you have so much to achieve, Ms. Francis. I want to be like you. I want to be in TV like you. I want to speak English like you. We are here to motivate our students and to inspire their dreams. Core foundation. This to me is core and it doesn't matter if I'm teaching at the high school level, at the elementary level, if I'm teaching staff, this is the most important and core foundation for our students, whether they're immigrants or not. Heritage, validate where they come from, their families. Education works different in the US than it does for many other cultures. We need to validate what our parents are doing with their children. If we tell our parents that they are teaming us with us in education, we are validating who they are, where they come from, and that is so powerful. Language. We need to make sure that yes, we learned English because that is the language that we use here in America but validate our students' home language. It's okay to speak that in the households. It's okay to speak that in a classroom. If my student feels more comfortable doing a presentation in home language, then do it. There's so much research there that supports that when a student masters L1, which is home language, student will produce L2 much faster or second language much faster. If our target language is English, perfect, but it doesn't have to be the only language our students speak. Literacy, I share with you how I came here as an interrupted education child, lacking a lot of knowledge, but that doesn't mean I was an empty vessel, an empty mind. I had the ability to do critical thinking. I knew how to read and how to write. So investigate, find out what is it that your students can do and portray that, use that for your students to do their rare best. Life experiences and emigration experiences are so powerful. So back in 1994, when I was coming here to the United States, we stopped at you know, some areas in Mexico and we were walking around and we circled around El Angel de la Independencia, you know, the huge iconic um, angel in Mexico City. And I stare at it looking at us, a 15 year old thinking, what am I doing here? This is not where I'm supposed to be. I'm, I'm supposed to be in the United States. What is this? You know, as a 15 year old, you're such a close mindset and not thinking about what's gonna happen. Well, fast forward 25 years and you see a picture here at the top right corner. I was a lead teacher who took 42 teachers here from North Carolina part of the Go Global NC program that takes teachers throughout the world to experience different, different cultures. I was invited to be as a teacher leader and to share my experience as we walked the streets of Mexico. And in that moment, when we were walking around the Angel de la Independencia, I looked up and the very first thing I thought was, I was here as a 15 year old thinking, what am I doing here? And then 25 years later, that same experience is used to guide 42 other educators. Our students need to know that the life experiences and the migration experiences are important, are powerful, are core for them to know who they are. 
But if we don't tell them that, if we don't help them figure it out, how powerful this is, they may not see it. They have to see their own potential. For so many years, I struggled as a cashier. There's nothing wrong with working as a cashier. It's a job that pays bills, but it's not a profession. The passion and the potential to be a great educator was in me, but I didn't see it until someone highlighted it out, until someone gave me an opportunity to show my potential and dreams. Our students need to see that their dreams are possible. Did I ever dream about staying in stage and sharing stages with researchers? No. Just last year, I shared a platform with the SIOP model researchers, authors at the SIOP conference. Never in a million years, I thought I was going to be amongst giants, but dreams become a reality and our students need to see that this is core foundation. So today, here we are. This is my mother right in the middle. We all live here in the United States, of course. I have two sisters who live in Texas and my brother and my first sister live here in North Carolina with me. We're all working and contributing to this society. We're all making our best to be good citizens. Well, I'm still a Guatemalan. I'm not US citizen yet, but I'm working on that. But we're all good citizens. We contribute, we give our best to this country, a country that has given us the opportunity to show our potential. So I'd like to take some questions. I know you were given at the beginning some instructions and questions. So Emma, if you wanna jump in right now and let us see if there's any questions we can address for all of us. Yes, absolutely. So we have a question already from Caroline. And okay. it's by Emily. My question is what to do when a student comes in as a senior enough credits to be a senior, but it's a beginner newcomer. What is the balance between the push for graduation and the push for acquiring English? My school uses a credit recovery program that has a Spanish translation, but this results in students not learning English because they're not interacting in a classroom and practicing producing language. But as a first year student, they're in danger of failing regular classes or that they don't have enough class periods for the credits they need, et cetera. What is the balance here? Push, push for graduation or push for acquiring language even if they can pass the first year? Well, yeah, we, we do have the same situations. We do have students who do bring enough credits and just all they need is to learn the language and acquire um, the courses that are required here in the US such as the English and uh, the histories. And we, the, there has to be a balance. When we talk to students about if you're going to college or you will be going to college and you need to learn English so you can uh, learn, continue your education. So we just kind of encourage our students, provide them with tools for them to acquire the English as fast as possible. You know, as students who, came, who come here highly prepared or literate, they can, they have the tools for them to acquire the language a lot faster. Now, I mean, nowadays, there's so many apps that we can use for our students to acquire the language. But you know what, even if the student does not make it to graduation, our ultimate goal is not to hand our students a paper that says you finish high school. I think it is a great goal, but there are other options. I tell my students from the very beginning, this country has options. You take them or you leave them. These are your options. They need to know. I tell them about the GED. The GED is a way for them to get into college. Let's not take that away. So they need to know that they have the option of pushing themselves hard to be able to get the credits and learn the language or if they meet the age uh, limit, then they can get a GED. Um, so that's my answer. Hopefully that answers your question. 
Thank you, Emily. We have another question. Have you had students that spoke another language other than Spanish? Yes, as a matter of fact, right now I have two students from Yemen. So they speak Arabic and it, you know what, when I transferred to the high school level, I did it because when I walked into the classroom, there were 19 students and there were like five, six different languages. So it is challenging because I can't use my Spanish to get my points across, but we use picture books with our students. You know, my students haven't been in school for a few years. So we have to be starting from scratch, how to learn the alphabet. Of course, I don't, I don't teach the alphabet like if they're in kindergarten, but through literature and through uh, reading picture books, we acquire the language and we also use their home language. I mean, I really wish I had this little iPhone back in 1994 when I was in school. Today, all I have to do is press you know, and say something in English and it translates quickly to my student uh, in his home language. So language is not a barrier. What is a barrier is, do we have the passion to reach them, to go out of our comfort zone, to be able to get our point across and to teach them, um, you know, to validate who they are. Thank you. One more. What about when you're teaching math or science and you have newcomers? You, and I know that they already have an ESO teacher. Yeah. So right now, the program that we have right now is newcomers come to me for one period. So they are with me for one period where they are learning English in my class. And then the other three, they are in core courses, math, English, social studies, anything they need for graduation. And I go into the classrooms to help them. This is a culture of English language teachers that we have to share throughout the building. My teachers know I am not the only one who is teaching English to these students. So whenever I have newcomers, I quickly go to the teacher and say, what are we gonna do to help these students? We're gonna let them use home language. We're gonna use you know, a visual, you're gonna use pictures. We're gonna use, I try to share my passion with those teachers to make sure that they are uh, making content accessible for teachers. I have more luck with some than others, but you know what? You can't hide passion. So when a teacher sees that I am very passionate and when the student shows that he or she is really passionate about education, you win that teacher's heart. I have had teachers like the email I showed you who two, two years ago wrote that email, but today he's at the office asking the principal, I'm sorry, asking the principal to get newcomers into his class because his heart changed. He was able to see and give teachers, the students those potentials, those opportunities. So they're gonna struggle, yes, but it's a good struggle. I tell my students, I said, it's not gonna be easy. It's going to be hard. I don't lie to my students, but use your phone, translate as much as you can, uh, ask questions, raise your hand, make sure that they have a buddy and they are getting their credits for graduation. And it's not all about just ESL classes. It's about learning the language through content. Thank you. One more question from Jody Whitehouse. As someone who only speaks English, how can I bridge the language barriers between myself and my students' parents? Oh, that's a great question. You know, it's very important to make sure that you are teaming up with your students. Again, language barrier is not an excuse today. You know, it's 2020, you know, we have so many tools that you can use to be able to, I don't even, I don't use those tools because the parents that I interact with either speak my language or my Arabic family speaks English, but there's so many tools out there, so many apps that you can use to be able to communicate with fa family. They need to know that you are including them. They need to know that you validate their input if your families never hear from you, even if it's in English, 
if you don't show them that you're trying to reach out, your families are not going to engage, especially with some cultures who see teachers up in a pedestal and they see them that they're the most important thing in the world. And it's true, like in Hispanic culture, our teachers are everything and we let them decide everything for our kids. But you need to come down from that pedestal and tell your parents that we're at the same level, whether it's English and you know trying to translate it or you going out of your comfort zone to uh, speak your student's language. Thank you. We have two more questions before okay. we close this sure. session. Okay, another one from Mariela. I admire your resiliency and how you've been able to maintain such a positive attitude in the face of so many challenges. I'm sure you felt this hardener and discouraged at times. How have you been able to overcome those feelings? What could you recommend for other teachers to overcome? For other teachers? Uh, you know, my passion is driven or it's, it's ignited by my students. So I create lessons where I get to know my students. So we read books and we read stories that I know are going to connect with my students' experiences. And when you get to know more about your students, that gives you the strength to carry on. So the other day I was just thinking, oh my gosh, did I make the right choice to move from the elementary to high school? But all of a sudden I get a letter from one of my students saying how passionate she is to continue school. And that letter itself gave me the strength that yes, I am in the right place. So how do you jump, how do you maintain your focus? How do you maintain your fire? How do you maintain your passion? Focus on your students they are gonna give you the strength. Learn from them, have them tell you how they feel. And that is where I get my strength from. Thank you. And our last question for today. Okay. How do you combat a home life where an ESL student is being told education isn't important and they need to be working to contribute to the household so they have no investment in their own education? You know, that's important to um, honor in families. You need to understand that there are families here who probably brought their kids here because they need to help out a home and begin working. You know, when I started working as a 16, 16 year old, um, it, it was a little bit of income that I was bringing to the household that was helping. So it's not that they don't value education. It's just education it's not a priority because surviving is takes over a higher priority. So what we can do with our families is encourage them, provide them resources, team up with your community. What resources does our community have that can help students and families like that? Maybe there's a resource in our community that can support the family so the child can go to school and get the education they need. Just share that with students. Sometimes they just don't know what opportunities the community has. So if you do encounter a family like that, and I do right now, I have a student who teachers kept bugging me. So-and-so is not doing homework. So-and-so is not logging in online. I said, because so-and-so is working 12 hours in a construction site. So it's important for you to understand your student's story and what is happening so you can support them and have um, uh, advocate for them at school. But and then you have to understand your families and respect that. If that's what the families want to do, let them take the decision for their families. We don't know better than their families. Their families know what's best for their children. And here's my contact, my email. I know there's probably no more time for questions, but email me. I'm, I'm transparent. I will answer any questions for you and stay in touch. My story is blogged. So if you go to my blogs, you'll find videos, you'll find written blogs that you can use with your students. I have teachers using my blog to read with students so students can connect. So if I can help you and support you in any way, I'm here to serve. 
Thank you so much, Emily. We are very happy that you joined us for our keynote session today. You have such an inspiring story and I've seen all the messages. Thank yous and Twitter. Um, to our participants, if you don't follow her on Twitter yet, that's actually how I started connecting with her, how I met and heard her story. Follow her on Twitter. She always have such great, inspiring things to share with you all. Lots of learning. She leads different chats, different book studies in there too. So follow her. Um, we're going to go ahead and end our keynote session. Um, the first breakout session starts at 10 a.m. So feel free to look through your email for the next link to join that Zoom session. If you want to hear more about Emily, she has another session tomorrow at 1. Yes. So if you are already registered for that, great. If not, I think you had a few seats left. It's almost completely sold out. So an opportunity to learn and hear from her. But thank you so much for everyone to join us on this rainy day. We are excited to learn with you um, the rest of today and tomorrow. Okay, thank you so much. Have a great day.